name's Nathan McCoy and I'm a landscape ecologist. My interest is in how vegetation and landscape relate and the, the presentation I'm going to be talking about here is one I gave to uh, Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia back in 2010 and it's called Interpreting Fitzgerald Biosphere Ecology, Natural Patterns and Processes. So this is just an introductory slide that shows a picture of Australia with a green circle around where Fitzgerald Biosphere is. And Fitzgerald Biosphere is a place, um, a biosphere reserve, a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve between Albany and Esperance, centred by Fitzgerald River National Park. And this comes in further and just shows the, the biosphere, Fitzgerald Biosphere uh, area um, with a black line and centred on Fitzgerald River National Park showing the, the buffer and transition zones. What this doesn't show, because it's been done since, is the um, transition zone we've got in the in the in the ocean, which is the marine, the state marine waters are now included in what ended up being renominated as Fitzgerald Biosphere, but that's a recent thing. Uh, so Fitzgerald Biosphere is a biosphere reserve because it's a natural wonder. So just a few points about that. UNESCO, it, it achieved a UNESCO's Man and Biosphere listing in 1978, but that was at the old uh, old. Uh, biosphere types that were only a protected area, that is they were only a, a national park or a reserve. Um, it's an, a landscape that's very ancient, it's eroded, it's very subtle, it's, cr it's cryptic and it's relatively intact. That is there's farming a around the national park and in the area, there's cleared landscapes but there's also a lot of intact natural landscapes and seascapes. It's geologically diverse, there's five major geological types from the upland first, so inland is, it's the southern edge of the Yulgarn granite craton. Um, there's a marine, a marine plain that lies across the middle of it, uh, which is an Eocene marine plain, underlined by spongelite, was put there by Eocene oceans 40 to 80 million years ago. Um, and uh, the, on the coast there's, there's the Albany Fraser uh, Agnese system, which is the same is the material at uh, the Prongrups and Albany, Esperance and the Fraser Range. Uh, that's one, two, three. There's the Barrens Quartzite Range which dominates the coast, the Barren Range known by Flinders in 1801, um, which is quartzite which are old bits of seafloor, they're not mountains at all but I think I'll get onto that a bit later. Um, and so they stick up, they're very hard, this welded sand and the last is a, a fairly small type, but it's the coastal limestones, a very recent geological type, so that's the five. The drain, it's got drainage system diversity, um, it's got a si series of wetlands, river systems that drain southwards, salt lakes, or players, more technically called, uh, estuaries at the ends of those rivers before they meet the ocean, and there's an ocean influence. But as I said before, it's got an ocean. The southern ocean is part of Fitzgerald Biosphere. Um, it's got a diversity of soil and landform systems with a very intricate soil mosaic. It's mostly re reworked and impoverished. The only freshening, and I'll get to more of this in a minute, is in the river systems and the swamp systems where there's been organic matter coming in. So it's the only soil development and the plants tell us about that. So it's got immense botanical diversity in the biosphere area. That broad area has got about 2,500 species, probably more than 2,500, with a variety of lifestyles and preferences and that's they're terms that I choose to use to talk about plants to help people get their minds around these things have got lifestyles and they have got preferences, this sort of behaviour. So to pull that apart a bit, uh, there's a lot of endemic and within that very localised species, a lot of common and widespread species as well that are found outside the biosphere area. Um, many of them are disturbance averse, that is those that occupy very old landscapes aren't good at handling disturbance that is fire or bulldozers or soil movement or nutrient input. Um, there's very few disturbance opportunists, they're mainly grasses and those things that occupy those river systems, a few trees and shrubs. Uh, there's few that are nutrient, oh, nutrient abstemious, that is they don't like, they're not big on nutrients and they're very good at getting what there is out of the soil like the proteaceous plants for instance, there's a lot of them. Uh, nutrient gluttony, I've termed it here, there's a few of them. Yeah, mainly things like swamp yokes, those things that occupy valley floors and wet dynamic places with rich soil. Dispersal limited, there's a lot of those. They don't, they're not good at dispersing and dispersal able, there's a few and again 
those dispersal able few are in the water courses and river systems. Uh, you probably talked to Steve Hopper already about this. So Steve talks about this in a broad world sense, but you can actually apply it locally as well. So that's what I've looked at doing, uh, and as I'll explain. So it's to do with Ockbill and Yodfell as old climatically buffered in fertile landscapes versus young, often disturbed fertile landscapes. And you can see that comparing um, nor the nor a lot of the northern hemisphere with parts of the southern hemisphere like where we are in southwestern Australia. And you can even within Australia compare an older landscape being the southwest to a that is old since glaciation or soil development and buffered by the oceans and isolated and infertile because it's so old and eroded. Whereas compared to the east coast, which is a much 40 times younger, still has sharpness in the landscape, being the Australian Alps and the Great Dividing Range and so on, um, is uh, much younger, has real soil and the plants that are on those soil types behave very differently than, it, than the, old, the ones on, that occupy the very old sites. So I've explained what Ockville and Yodfell is. Uh, and there's global and local relativities I just described, and I've provided the reference there for, for Steve, uh, Steve's work there. And there's a couple of, some three pictures on that page. There's Steve Hopper standing underneath a, a tree that he and I named in 2009, called Eucalyptus brandyander, named after Grady Brand, who's the curator of the Botanic Garden at Kings Park. And another picture of a very old bit of landscape, uh, Mount Caroline in the central wheat belt, and there's young Ben Lulfit standing next to Eucalyptus caesia, a very charismatic and very, very old type of eucalypt. And their third image is one taken by Olivia Millard from the Nature Conservancy, or she was then at the Nature Conservancy, of um, uh, a, a mountain range in China with a big river valley in it and a conifer forest. Chan, you can go to the sixth slide now. So. I'm going to focus in on, on local Ockbill and Yodfall here in Fitzgerald Biosphere. There's two pictures there. One showing uh, Mount Bland in the Western Barrens and Royal Hakia, which is a very, very, it's, a, it's almost endemic to Fitzgerald River National Park. Um, it's incredibly charismatic uh, and it's a member of the Proteaceous family, occupies old landscapes. The other picture there is Bremer River in Fitzgerald Biosphere on the western side and it shows. Uh, Yate woodland and, and Melaleuca shrublands in a dynamic yodfall. So there's an Ockbull up here with the Royal Hakea and a, and a yodfall with the, the creek system. I'll introduce this idea of the natural patterns and processes approach. And that looks at uh, the geology, climate, drainage, soils and vegetation. So it develops those layers to provide a, a picture of the patterns and the processes that have delivered what's resulted in the vegetation. So what I'll do is go through each of those headings. So geology, climate, drainage, soils and vegetation is a series of slides. And geology is obviously the underlying rocks. In the Fitzgerald biosphere it's diverse. I said there's five main types. Critical factor is the barren range that we call the range are not mountains. They're actually old bits of seafloor that were caught up in the continental collision between uh, Australia and it rifted off Antarctica. Those old bits of seafloor that are what's called Barron's Quartzite. Now, well, quartzite is welded sand. So the pieces of seafloor that were later became, when exposed to the air, sandstone cliffs. And those sandstone cliffs were overridden by when An Antarctica, the Mawson Craton, pushed up over the top of the what's now the south coast of Australia um, and buried those pieces of sandstone cliff under about 30 kilometres of Earth's crust and welded them together, let sand form rock out of it and then subsequently as Australia rifted off and a massive amount of erosion since then, because they're 1.4 billion years old since they were sand, has left them upstanding, hence we call them mountains. So there's a fair bit of landscape relief in the biosphere, there's up, well it's quite subtle, it's not like the Himalayas, but there's uplands and lowlands and there's steps between, which is reflective of the underlying geology uh, and it's weathered by climate clearly so it's weathered by wind by exposure to air by rain by chemical actions provided by the moisture and so it's all climate reactive it's a basis for drainage and soil development that is the weathering products become soil and the patterns of the movement of that by erosion are the, uh, form the drainage lines in a broad sense the faults in that geology provide unit boundaries that is between, there's a cracker that if you stand on East Mount Barron and look uh, eastwards you can see there's a great big uh, triangle that comes to a point 
at East Mount Barron looking eastwards and it goes about 700 kilometres east in an isosceles triangle and that's the Esperance sand plain sits on that and that the line that that heads off along the, the inland line of the isosceles triangle is a Jurta cut up fault and it's the, a fault line where the where the Phillips River cuts down and then across and through and down part of the bottom end of it and it, it provide there's a ramp there supplied by the Ravensthorpe ramp along the edge of that fault and the Esperance sand plain is filled in up to that edge and it's sand there and uh, igneous derived stuff above to the north and within that weathering product being soil there's a whole range of nutrients trace elements and minerals it's all a variety of and, and a variety of a fair bit and a variety of bugger all um, and it characterizes the landscape so that, that everything I just described provides the character landscape with the character it's got three pictures there the top one is looking from East Mount Barron eastwards across the Esperance sand plain in that isosceles triangle I talked about with Cullum Inlet just there in the ocean and that's the Esperance sand plain the other one, the middle one is Ravensthorpe Range to the north of East Mount Barron in the eastern part of Fitzgerald Biosphere which is a, an igneous intrusion into the Yulgarn block of greenstone, what gets called greenstone, highly mineralised, very rich soils and incredibly complex flora. Uh, and the last picture down the bottom is the twerd up cliffs which is a, a, a breakaway system at the side of the Fitzgerald River Valley into that old Eocene marine plain, the spongilites there. Uh, it's climate, so we'll have a look at the climate. So it's historic climate processes, not what happened last week or last year or the year before, it's over a long history. It's also delivered enormously over history, sea level ups and downs, and island formation and deformation. So sea levels will be going up now like yo-yos for millennia, and you can see that in, a, in, the, um, in the rocks and in the, in the mountains. You can see that the top picture here is uh, the central barrens looking from Point Anne in the western biosphere across to the middle and you can see wave cut benches on the, the outfall of those quartzite features and that's the action of an Eocene ocean that was 90 metres higher than it is now pulling material down off the off the off those mount, what we call mountains um, to form those wave cut benches and at that time in that Eocene ocean which is between 40 and 80 million years ago those mountains what we, were bigger and they were, they were islands it's stuck up out of it. May explain some of the speciation on them. Anyway, oh, what's the next bit? Uh, drainage. So there's wide valley and estuary development caused by that climate being water movement and wind and the chemical actions therefore from that. Um, soil development and de-development being there's development of soil into valley floors where gravity and erosion puts the, the, the new soils down into them with mixed soils with nutrients from organic matter and a bit of weathering of, of rocks and then the inverse of that is the de-development being the erosion the, the, that's a depositional landscape it, the inverse is the, the erosional landscape from where that materials come from becoming skeletal and nutrient poor episodic conditions floods and droughts those big ticket big mess making things like big floods and in prolonged droughts have put pressure on the biota to impede it or supply it with energy or um, opportunities to breed. I, I mentioned before wind, rainfall and those things all influence the vegetation. So the top picture here is the wave cut benches on the barrens as I described the centre middle picture is a sand dune overtaking a patch of a relatively rare eucalypt called uh, un, sub, uh, eucalyptus unita subspe calcicola subspecies unita which is common in the western parts of the Bremer peninsulas um, that occurs from there across to Denmark in a very patchy distribution on limestone and the bottom picture is I took that picture in 1995 when there was a very severe drought in the district and you could see it in the vegetation in the National Park and is showing a big pile of drought deaths in some of the proteaceous plants. So drainage is the result of the influence of climate on geology as I've said before and it's from micro to macro that is a very small scale tiny little, little creeks and rivulets and um, movement of soil from smaller little little puddles for instance um, to macro being a, an enormous river system that's or an estuary that was formed um, mindful too that I said before that the Eocene ocean had had the ocean right up high during the Eocene somewhere between 40 and 80 million years ago well much more recently probably at the last glacial maximum only the order of 
probably seven to twelve, maybe a thousand years ago, these the ocean was the the shoreline was much further out, it was about fifty kilometres further out, when all of that water was taken up by the the ice pack, and since then the sea level's risen up to its present day, and the estuaries uh, where they are now are only about six thousand years old, which is very very young. So that's perhaps a macro. Um, so the soil development during, I, I think I mentioned this in the last slide, but nutrient concentrating and erosion and deposition. That is nutrient concentrating downslope in valley floors, in, drain, in swamps and so on, and taken away from the higher parts and the sides of higher parts. Um, the drainage does provide disturbance, which vegetation has taken the opportunity from because um, there's response vegetation responding to the drainage, not just the supply of water, but the supply of different types of soil which has supported different vegetation types too. And so evolves perhaps too strong. I suppose in a, in a long term evolves one thing, but to assemble there because they, they're favoured by it, they prefer that. A bit like weeds in a paddock. There are all lots there because it's disturbance is common and that's what they like. It's provided aquatic systems, freshwater, saltwater, brackish in between and it supplies unique habitat and the pictures at the side there at the top is a picture of a if you're in the middle of the slide there's a little um, gone and fish called Galaxias maculatus or spotted minnow it's about 75 mm 80 millimeters long it's and and these are things that uh, head it up stream to breed when it floods and this is when you can see it's skipping up through the through the very shallow water about a centimeter deep making its way upstream in Callurup Creek in the northwestern part of the biosphere which is in the Garden of a Catchment. The middle picture is a picture of Pable Up Swamp after the floods had receded from 1993. It was really wet, 1993. And you can see the line in the middle is where the flood level was down to the greenish water you can see. Now this picture was taken in 19, uh, early 1995, so 18 months later. The bottom picture is Wellstead Estuary showing the fringing vegetation of, of paperbark. This slide's about soil. So Soils, as I said before, are the result of geological weathering, drainage and erosion. You bring all that together, you get soil, in, in, again in a broad sense. Um, what's been delivered in a soil in Fitzgerald Biosphere is intricate and complex mosaic of different types, given all the, all the processes I just described. It's reworked and reworked and repositioned and taken away and put there and all that, so on. So, but many of them are old and reworked. They're not new and fresh and fertile. Some of them are fresh and dynamic and they're the ones that have deposited down into the river systems, lowest points. They're mostly nutrient stripped, that is they've had, they've become skeletal because they've been removed from. They're generally poor structure, that is when people talk about poor soil structure they're talking about whether you can go a good crop in it. I'm sure the banksias and the honey eaters don't care because it suits them but what we call a poor structure for human enterprise but good for nature. They're matched to vegetation types or more, more to the point vegetation types are matched to soil types and that mosaic supports plant endemism. So you get the mosaic is a patterning and each each piece of that pattern generally has a different plant community and a different plant assemblage on it which is just old and it's sorted that way over enormous amounts of time from high, literally dropping down to in, uh, over time. Three pictures there. One shows the, the, the sponge like cliffs at Twert up with the erosional processes uh, depositing, taking material off the cliff face and depositing it in the valley floor in the foreground. The central picture is paddock at Ravensthorpe, and I thought that was shadows being cast by the, the clouds, but it was, only a bit of it was. And you can see the red soil in the foreground and the pale soil in the mid, and you can see a bit of cloud over it to the, to the left hand side and then a tree line at the back. Well, that's just showing the soil types across a paddock. It gives it in, indicates this complexity. It's much more complex than that in many places, but it just shows you what a, I mean in a fallowed paddock. And the bottom picture here is, is a, 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 mil, a Milleluca sophisma, which is very common in a very small area. So in the Cundip area, its natural occurrence is over a rhombus-shaped um, distribution pattern, 2.9 kilometres by 1.9 kilometres and as within that it's really common but that's it that's on earth that's where it is on these clay quartzite soils. This is about the vegetation I just introduced. So they're matched to soils as I said greatly diverse in communities and species so vegetation being plant communities as, as a group. Uh, many endemic and localised plants on that array of soil types and the patterns in that. 
Most of them are disturbance averse and dispersal limited, as I said a little while ago. They are what forms the habitat in most cases. There's also geology that provides some habitat, but generally the vegetation provides habitat as food, cover, other resources, fibre resources and so on. They're flammable at critical times, that vegetation. It's misunderstood. We don't understand the patterning or we don't appreciate how old it is and we don't appreciate how in some ways robust that it is and other, otherwise, otherwise is very prone and fragile. What looks rough and prickly is in fact quite, it might look hostile and feel hostile but it's actually quite vulnerable. Uh, and it's changing, it's a drying climate and there's more frequent fire and it's pushing change upon it that I don't think it evolved with. So I'll just go back. What I mean by that is that I, th I think it's becoming evident that the, what we're seeing is, I'm calling adaptations in plants, are in fact coping mechanisms. So by, by and, and this is all to be tested, and I think we need to do a lot more ex exploration of these concepts, is that one of the, the logics of, to follow that logic, as I see fire as a damaging process, it can also provide life, provide opportunity, it forces things to regenerate. And that, that I don't know that that's necessarily an ideal thing. Because things can regenerate, th things being plants, can regenerate without fire as well, under certain circumstances like light penetration or extra moisture or they don't need to for a very long time. So the presence of a plant responding or, or growing by seed because of fire, maybe it's just a healing process. So it's a bit like a scab. They might look pretty but they're really just nature's vegetation scabs to occupy a site, to patch, heal it up so that then it, it, can, it can repair. So I think Maybe another exploration of that is by that logic, we, sh we all should have our bones broken every six months because that's how long they take to heal up. When there's, there's a lot of exploration to be done in that space. Landscape unit pattern. So I, I, with all that in mind, I, I put this thing together called the landscape unit pattern of Fitzgerald Biosphere. And this shows a map where it shows different landscape units that I've called them. And this is mapped by landscape dynamism. And I've called it the Albany Fraser Coastal you can see in bright green, there's very little bits of that and they're really on the ends of the peninsulas at down on the southwestern corner of the biosphere. Uh, Albany Fraser Islands, there's only a few of those which are offshore but I had to include them in Doubtful Islands for instance. Depositional dynamics, that's all the river systems and, and swamp systems where drains go into and it's, it's the freshest, youngest part of the landscape and it's got the greatest uh, fertility. There's the Esperance Sand Plain West. There's an Esperance Sand Plain East as well, but it doesn't occur in Fitzgerald Biosphere. I did it for a broader mapping exercise of the south coast, but you can see the yellow part in the eastern part of the biosphere. And like I said, you can see it comes to a point at East Mount Barron, which is in the very western end of it. And that is a sand plain infill. And you can tell it's the Esperance Sand Plain because it's full of plants that only occur on that sand plain. Some of them get up onto East Mount Barron a bit, but that's just a proximity feature. Uh, there's Greenstone, which is the Ravensthorpe Range. There's Marine Plain, which is the blue stuff through the centre, which is the, again, that twert up, that marine Eocene laid down Marine Plain and the weathering products of that on its surface. The Quartzite Range is the Barrens through there up to Cundip, which is just south of Ravensthorpe as well, which is Quartzite. And then the Yulgarn Block East, which is the majority of it across the top, the brown stuff, where the, it's the southern edge of the Yulgarn Craton as it dips off the Ravensthorpe ramp down onto the marine plane. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and this is vegetation type by dyn dynamism and I've just given three examples here of yodful to okbul. So the most yodful type is, there's two examples here in the pictures. One is the same creek line I showed before the Bremer River with the yate and it's woodland or sparse woodland and the Melaleuca shrubland along the side of a creek and a, 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 a swamp, a freshwater swamp north of Ravensthorpe. And you can see the regeneration of all of the swamp yate along the side of the road there in the gravel. These are highly responsive systems. And that it's fertile, it's freshly deposited and it's dominated swamp yate. Woodlands are a classic vegetation type in those, those that yodful. Um, infrequent disturbance, low fertility, old deposit are uh, Morton Mallet woodlands. So, so the, the next subset down is in these old deposits that are no longer so dynamic, there's not, they're not a water course, but they're nevertheless laid down by erosion. They're a depositional place where 
soil's gone to and sat in, formed in a basin, and you, they've got a, quite an intricate pattern across the biosphere. They're occupied by woodlands, typically by what's called mort eucalyptus platypus and, and some mallets, another type of eucalypt uh, tree. And as you can see, they can look very different. There's a mature one at the top and the centre, and the very, a very similar woodland below, after it's been burnt, it's full of obligate cedars. They're all obligate cedar dominated communities. Um, there's almost no re-sprouters in them. And you can see all these pioneer plants in the bottom picture, the yellow glycericarium and the purple um, gastrolobium in the bottom. But in time, that bottom picture will end up looking like the top picture. And the extreme um, long infrequent disturbance, infertile, ancient deposit, there is this ancient depth, um, very ancient deposit of sand, but skeletal sand plain shrublands, which is typical Quonkin, very old nutrient depleted soils, white often or pale, um, and they're occupied by these incredibly diverse Proteaceae dominated plant communities that have got incredible abilities at both holding fragile soil together but also mining nutrients out of them. So that's the story there. I'll go to the next slide which is an example of a mort. So we'll go to the, some examples here. An old deposit that is Eocene breakaway and valley floor woodlands. And there's two endemics here, an endemic in, which is endemic to Fitzgerald biosphere, Karakarup mort and Chillinup mallet. Well actually technically Chillinup mallet is not quite because it occurs just across the river valley. It's just outside the biosphere. Anyway, and this just gives an idea of localised endemism as well. So on the left hand side is Chillinup mallet, Eucalyptus uh, melanophytra. So it's its fruits and buds and it is a tree next to a mo much more with rough bark and the bigger tree next to it is a much more common mallet called eastern brown mallet um, but we're dealing with a little rough bark tree on the left hand side the other one we're looking at here is eucalyptus vesiculosa or cracker up mort and you can see down the bottom in the center it's flowers and buds and fruits and you can see a picture of a large one on, on the, 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 the bottom right hand side the top picture here on the right hand side or push to the middle a bit shows the, the Eocene Valley floor which both of these plants occupy and they occupy these breakaway systems um, you can see in the mid ground there and to the left hand side. The characteristics of these, so what, what we're looking at here is, is the character to sort of a, a bit drill in a bit of, of what makes up these old systems so we're narrowing down. So geology is laterized spongelite, the climate again is weather it's a district, it's, a, it's known as Death Valley, this area, because it's in a, in a more recent sense it's quite dry compared to other places. And in a micro sense it's, it's a dry area with these um, sporadic rainfall patterns, though they're generally Mediterranean. Now the drainage system there is breakaway slope, valley floor and it's upper creek line. So that's what's going on in a drainage sense. The soils are very old deposits, they're powdery clay, pug clay, very heavy grey clay and decomposed laterite. And the vegetation on them is obligate seeding woodland and ephemeral understories. Infrequent disturbance tolerant, the dispersal limited and there's nutrients there in moderation certainly post fire. And there's a leaf drop from the, the abundant trees that, when it's old um, providing nutrients. And it's just, this is a picture that just shows in the Gondwanalink Karakarup area the distribution of Karakarup mort shown by a black circle. It's common inside that black circle but that's it in the world. Doesn't occur anywhere else. Garden, someone might have planted it. Here's the other picture. The other shape here is chilling up mallet. You could have this melanophytra and it's showing its distribution which is a bit bigger than cracker up mort but nevertheless quite localised. It's a recurring story across the, uh, the biosphere. So the next slide puts them together. So within those two black uh, patches I showed before, I've broken that down further to show the actual patterning. So the black circles with the blue interior here um, is the chilling up mallet, its distribution, and you can see on there mostly it doesn't occur with the cracker mort. And the red cir uh, circles or shapes with the blue background show the, the cracker up mallet distribution and you can show in one instance they co-occur. Everywhere else they don't occur together, even though they're on similar landscape types. It seems that the melanophytra is on, on breakaway slopes and the mort is on grey cracking clays in the valley floors, so next to it. But they do occur together, both on breakaway tops and both on valley floors where they converge. So I'll go to the next slide. So just to go back over that, 
and say what that does. The Natural Patterns Approach interprets landscape ecology. So it, it provides process perspectives, it provides a landscape history, it discusses evolutionary responses in the flora, um, ecological relationships within and between vegetation communities and landscape. Habitat development it deals with that. It deals with sensitive species context as the Quonkin's a ex classic example of that. It talks about ecological management. It, it that if you, so if you not understand this type of patterning and where these plants are and aren't, you, it's a better approach to how you manage them. You might be more robust with some, push them around more. Others you've got to be much more careful about what you do. Um, is restoration application in this, so to, to rest restore degraded landscapes, if you understand some of this stuff, you'll be better at it, you'll do a better job. And really importantly, it helps uh, with people's historic connections and contemporary connections to it by looking at it from a different way. It's not just a, plants are not just passengers sitting there, they, you know, stuff happens. Three pictures there are, one taken by Amanda Keesing of Now and Up at the front, the front entrance, the sign there. The flowers and buds in the middle are of that new species of mallet, Eucalyptus brandiana, that Steve Hopper was standing before, next to in the previous slide. And there's Eugene Eads and Chris Robinson sitting down looking at some very recent revegetation, which that was taken in 2005, that picture. That stuff's now five metres tall. They, I acknowledge Professor Steve Hopper at University of Western Australia for his Ockball Yodful theory. Jill Craig at Ravensthorpe for discussions about the flora and patterning over at Ravensthorpe area. Bill Moyer of Albany for, and I learnt all the geological stuff I've talked about there, I learned of Bill. The late Ken Newby, because he was, he was the, the fellow that really got to start to really seriously get the grips with the flora out there. Pierre Horwich at Edith Cowan University for discussions about the natural patterns process and his encouragement. Eugene Eads and Nungar Leader, who's at Now and Up for a, a context of, of his people. At DEC South Coast Nature Conservation Team, which I've had many conversations with over a long time about this. Sarah Barrett, Sarah Comer, Janet Newell and Dion Upper. And people from Gondwanalink being Amanda Keesing, Justin Johnson, Barry Hodenrake from Greening Australia and Gondwanalink. And uh, Assistant Professor Tinker Sack of University of Western Australia, uh, Architecture, Landscape and Visual Arts, but that, that outfit no longer exists. And a picture there of Steve Hopper and Luke Swedeman at the type site of Eucalyptus brandiana. A picture of Eugene Eads in the middle and the picture of Jill Craig, Sarah Barrett and Sarah Comer discussing Miller Lucas Stromantosa at Ravensthorpe. And that's the end.